Uh, thanks, thanks for coming. My name is Wim Stocks. I'm the CEO of ESC. I uh, appreciate we're on the, on the downside of uh, Unite and appreciate you guys uh, hanging around to, to hear our talk. Um, the name of our, our discussion, uh, as you can see, 12 games for 30 players in 12 months. Um, it's, it's, there's certainly challenges and, and uh, uh, lessons learned we hope to impart to you as, as part of this. What this doesn't say is that we did all this on a, on a brand new platform, uh, which I'm going to talk you through in, in, uh, in just a bit. This, pl this platform was also created by us, developed by us. Our offices are in, uh, in, in New York um, at uh, 19th and 5th. And our lab work and prototype work, uh, not only on the platform and the games, um, was all done there. Let me just introduce um, my, our uh, team here, uh, Pete Vigent, who's the head of our platform um, and head of game design, uh, and Kevin Harper, who's our lead developer. They are the meat of the uh, presentation, um, all of the good things that uh, uh, we learned and some, some, many of the challenges we experienced, but al also uh, a lot that we're still trying to figure out and, uh, and get in order. Uh, my, I had many concerns when we, when we launched our platform. Uh, primary one was tech, but our tech is holding up great. Um, and so you'll hear more about that from, uh, from Pete and Kevin. Before I, I take you through a little 101 on ESC, uh, I just want to thank, I don't think any of the Unity guys are here, but uh, we've had amazing support from uh, Francis and Carl and Mark and, and Jeff Hemingway. Um, uh, if, if they think that what we're doing is crazy, they haven't, they haven't said it to us and they haven't uh, held, us, uh, uh, held us up about it. Uh, we are doing some, uh, I think we're doing some um, pretty innovative things, but there's a, a fair amount of craziness um, that we're, we're running into as we, as we do that. So, uh, so they're not here, but uh, uh, really nice of them to, uh, to support us as well as they have uh, and uh, invite us to, to uh, speak. Uh, let me just give you a little background on, thank you, go ahead, Pete, on what ESC is. We, we are, uh, first of all, we're a brand new platform. This platform's been in development for four years. Um, all done in New York City. We had a, a little bit of a hiatus into Secaucus. Uh, our partner in this endeavor is a company called PRG. If you've ever been uh, into a Broadway play and seen Spider-Man or Lion King uh, or any of the very elaborate set designs that go on in Broadway, that's what they do. They do set design, lighting, um, sound, uh, really experts in that field. We had the vision, our design team had the, uh, the vision for the platform and they helped us build it out uh, from a, an electronics and a, and a tech perspective. Um, so so it's, a, it's a unique proposition. Um, we are, in every regard, would be described as a local multiplayer experience. Our um, experience can handle up to 30 people simultaneously. Uh, in our game theater, which I'll talk you through in, in just a bit, this is, this is it, this is actually our prototype facility in. Uh, in uh, New York City, 35 foot wide screen, 14 foot high, um, high definition, two blended projectors. We have 7-1 surround sound. We have theatrical lighting that's that's better than <laughs> better than most theaters. Um, other special effects, uh, things like uh, smoke haze, um, as well as uh, uh, some wind wind effects. Um, we our controllers are adapted iPod touches uh, that we've. We've custom designed with, with uh, external cases that have a little haptic uh, feedback. Uh, and as well, we have a, a extremely low latency Wi-Fi network also um, that we created and designed that, that makes it all uh, sing and dance. The, the uh, experience itself is, is quite unique. As you can imagine, uh, uh, 30 people standing, up to 30 people standing in an environment. I'll talk about the games in just a bit. Um, one, the one thing that you can't really appreciate until you've done it and uh, experienced the, uh, the, the gameplay is how social and how interactive the, the games are and what the experience is all about. People uh, taunting one another, people uh, yelling at one another, people teaming up, people um, competing. There's even a little pushing and shoving when things get intense uh, that go on. That's not how, that's, we don't encourage that obviously, but, uh, but that, does, that does happen when, when the games get uh, competitive. 
And uh, we are, our games are, can be competitive. There are some are, are designed to be collaborative. All of them, uh, we strive for uh, leveraging this live experience and getting people to interact with one another um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the space. We've made, as the, as the talk indicates, we've made 12 games uh, led by Pete and Kevin. Um, uh, we pr we uh, actually made uh, uh, 10 of them, and two of them were produced by Warner Brothers. Uh, you might know two of the developers they employed, uh, one of which is Sarbacan out of uh, Montreal, uh, made a game called Astro Beams, and um, this, the second uh, developer, we just launched their game, a uh, company called Bumble Bear. You might not know them by Bumble Bear, but they're quite not noteworthy. They made another very um, groundbreaking local multiplayer game called Killer Queen in an in a eight-person um, arcade cabinet, and they're selling them for $15,000, and they, and they can't make enough of them. So uh, um, they've been a great help, and really the vision that they've had for what local multiplayer is and how to exploit our tech and our experience and, and making this, this uh, the game experience in our theater with, for up to 30 people come alive, uh, they've been, been great help on, on, in that regard. We are actually live um, as a commercial installation, although I would still describe us in, in our state as in, in pilot form. As I mentioned, we've, we've learned a lot. I think we've, well, some of the things I was concerned about are not come to pass, but, but there's a lot more that we need to learn as part of this pilot. Um, we are live in two commercial installations. We're in two different Buffalo Wild Wings uh, in a 750 square foot pr footprint. One's in Philadelphia, just outside of Philadelphia, Northeast Philadelphia, and one's in Riverside, California. We'll be in a third uh, location um, in Orlando, probably in the December time frame. All the construction's getting underway as we speak. Uh, and uh, for 2016, we, uh, we have two new venue partners coming on board. I won't talk about that too much more. Um, but we're here to, to help you all, hopefully through the lessons we've learned, can help you in not only in, in what you do in overall game development, but also in the context of uh, what we're all about. We are gonna, we're going to stick around afterwards for Q&A. Um, I'll also mention now, but also at the end, we we'll encourage anybody, if you're in New York City, uh, we'd love to have you come in and see what this is all about. As I said, it really... To, to experience it live is, is, will, will help you appreciate it a great deal. Or if you're out in Riverside or in Philadelphia, you can walk into a Buffalo Wild Wings. But we'd love to have you in and, uh, and, and give you the, the run through uh, uh, firsthand. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Pete for the lessons, lessons learned. Hi. Um, so I was told I have to go pretty fast because normally I, I talk a lot, but uh, just see our wonderful email addresses up there. If we don't cover something or if we skim over something that you have questions about in the future, um, please uh, ask one of us. So as Wim had said, um, I in general am the person concerned with design and the game design. Uh, so my main focus is making really fun experiences and maintaining the uh, design intent of the space. And Kevin's uh, main job is uh, making it come to fruition and making it real. So that's a, it's a good separation of powers as far as we're concerned. Um, but the first lesson we have, in, and it's really, it, it's like the most important one, which is that this is not easy. It's not for everyone. Not everyone can design 30 player games. And we knew that going into it. Um, what is a 30-player game? This is one of our, our failed prototypes, unfortunately. Uh, a 30-player game in, in a local space means that everyone needs to be engaged all at once. And of course, we have this situation where it's in a commercial installation, and people are coming in right off the streets, and they don't, they don't have time to practice uh, for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. They only have like about a minute to practice and jump right into the game. And so there's a lot of arcade learning there. But additionally, we have a 35-foot screen, which means that uh, players need to be able to see themselves and, and find themselves on the screen. We had to kind of do all these uh, avatar uh, uh, diagrams to figure out exactly how big you have to be to be able to find yourself on the screen. Um, especially if someone's standing right in front of you. We actually made this convention, which we say is shake to locate, where you can shake your device and your number will pop up over your avatar's head. Uh, the other thing that is just a big lesson learned overall is that uh, because we have this space where our game machine communicates with this crazy co uh, show control, uh, all the lighting and so forth, um, 
that's not easy either. It's really difficult to really understand that you're not just using those lighting, uh, those lighting effects. We have uh, over 60 lights in the ceiling. You're not just using those for spectacle, which is kind of what you'd initially think. You're also using those to communicate to the players and, and grab their attention and so forth. Um, the first uh, outside developer we worked with, we actually learned a lot from because based on their questions to us, and that was Sarbacon. And originally Sarbacon came to us with, with some prototypes which were all one-player games that 30 people played on the same screen. And, and that, there's a major difference. If you're doing one-player games, uh, with everyone, has, uh, everyone is not working with each other. They're, they're kind of working, um, uh, they're not dependent or interdependent with one another. And it took a lot of work to kind of get them to wrap their brains around how to, um, how to think of this, how to think of this field as a place where every player needs to have some form of agency and they all need to have something to do at all times and feel like they could win in the game. It's not enough to do a fighting game where someone dies in the first two seconds of the game and then they never come back because that would be a really lame experience, right? Uh, and so I actually, I come from the world of field games and big games. My, my history is making games out in the world with 100 people. And so that's a challenge that I come across a lot. And I have these couple of friends in New York uh, who made a great field game. The game was called Killer Queen. And they thought the Killer Queen was such a good field game that they wanted to make a video game out of it. And sure enough, they made Killer Queen Arcade. And uh, a lot of people in the audience probably have experienced it or seen it. And Killer Queen Arcade is amazing. And so we asked them to come in and do the second game for us. And they made something called Pixel Prison Blues. Pixel Prison Blues is uh, an amazing achievement in uh, a 30-player game uh, play. It also does something, it makes a lot of choices that we never would have made, which is, for instance, uh, they they have, uh, the teams are not the same size. There are more officers, or there are more inmates than there are officers, uh, and it's intentionally that way. It's, it's very odd and wonderful all at the same time. Um, but they are the type of person who, people who really could think about this space because they, they're used to thinking about five on five and so forth and balancing those kind of games. So that's just the first big lesson of, of anything I can give to you is that if you're imagining that you can design games for more than the standard four player local multiplayer, or if we're talking about Cluster Puck uh, or, or Night Squad, the eight player local multiplayer, once you get <laughs> up to the 20 player or 30 player, um, then you're, um, then you're, you're facing a lot of challenges that you would not normally face. And there's another huge challenge to this, and, it, and they face it a lot, and it kind of bothered them, which is that it's not always 30 players. We don't just happen to always have 30 players. Sometimes we have 15 players. And so your game also has to have balancing that scales, uh, which is uh, really challenging if you're a game designer. But fun. Um, the second lesson, and this just goes for everything that you ever do, play early and play often. Um, we have a game called Hat the Beast. It's about putting hats onto animals. And originally the idea was, um, for our very, very first prototype, it was uh, Boss said he liked the idea of paparazzi. And I was like, okay, so paparazzi like, uh, you know, where's Waldo and whatever. But then we thought like moving targets around the screen and, uh, and shooting at celebrities might come off the wrong way. And so someone had said, well, what if we put hats on the celebrities? That, that won't seem like you're shooting them in the head. And, uh, and we agreed. And so uh, I, we, I'm not a good programmer. I really, I, I'm action script. I'm sorry. That's all I know. Um, and so, uh, so I put together like this, this horrible uh, thing of, of celebrities and had people shout out what they saw on the screen. And, and sure enough, and it took like, you know, uh, maybe two hours to put it together and then project it. And uh, we were able to get a lot of great feedback from that. And then that went on to people who know how to make rough prototypes. And it became a very successful and popular game. Um, and then eventually we switched over when we put it out in the commercial world, we switched over to animals because they don't have lawyers. Um, and so the second game we, we thought of uh, was a game called uh, uh, Suck and Blow. And this was one of, those were our two initial games when we were trying to make a prototype. We wanted something kind of simple that, that people would just pick up and play. And the idea was you're sucking up particles that are across the screen. And we thought that would be a good visual. It's kind of abstract, spacey. And you're just sucking up good particles and blowing away bad particles. And, uh, and so again, I'm coming from big games. I wanted to, sh I wanted to show that this was really fun. Uh, so we got two shop vacs. And I, I, I dipped into my... Uh, <laughs> my 
my inventory of balls and uh, put them on a table. And people had a lot of fun playing it. So, uh, so we were able to go from that. So it's just like whatever you can do to get your first paper prototype out there, uh, the faster the better. We've been doing play testing uh, for all of the ESC games that, that we've been working on for as long as we've had ideas for them. You know, the, the first time that Kevin can give us uh, a playable, uh, the, the better. We would bring 10 people, 20 people out there uh, to just test everything out. Uh, the third lesson, and this is something I talk a lot about uh, as from a design perspective, is uh, if you're making a game, you have to find the fun. Uh, so I, one day, I, I went to Kevin's desk, and, uh, and this was totally unnecessary, and I drew a cube. He knows what a cube looks like, but I drew a cube, and I was like, Kevin, can you make a cube just move around on the screen? And so, so he's like, yeah, and he kind of rolled his eyes at me like I was dumb. I didn't need to draw a cube. I could have just said it. But so he, he made a cube. He put it on a plane, and then we went to the, we had all these great playables, but then we had this, uh, this one that was just moving cubes around by swiping your finger, and like everyone's like, can we play that cube game again? And we're like, well, you're just driving a cube around a screen. Well, it turned out that people really liked it. Uh, we put some rules around it, made it into cube ball, uh, and now it's one of our more popular team games. It's kind of like a soccer game uh, with cubes, and you smash each other, and it's a ton of fun. So uh, what we, we have all these aspirations from a design perspective. I put together these 50-page game design documents about this complex systems and thinking about it, and then we go up there and we find that people have the most fun by watching our play test by just driving a cube around on the screen, and I'm not going to... Uh, so I'm like, okay, let's just make that game. Let's do that. Um, the second thing is uh, we... Uh, we had this idea of having like um, this uh, sumo game where you're driving around, you're claiming territory. Uh, this was sumo cars. And we were like, oh, this is going to be a lot of fun uh, claiming territory. And no one did the goal of the game. No one was trying to satisfy the goal of the game. All they were trying to do was knock each other off the side and smash into each other. They thought that was the most fun. Um, and so that brings us to our next point, which is uh, no one to quit. Sometimes you have an idea, uh, and no matter how much you're fighting for it, maybe it's not the right idea. Um, so we, uh, we transitioned from our sumo cars to, to sumo fruit. We were like, okay, you're claiming territory within a bowl, and you're a fruit. But still, people just wanted to smash each other. That was it. They were drawn to smashing each other. And so we completely threw out the game, and we just kept the one thing that happened, which was people were smashing each other and had joy from that, and we made a game called Fruit Tattoo, where the main game element, the main game mechanic is that you smash each other. Um, it's like Destruction Derby uh, with a little bit of Capture the Flag in it. Uh, and it's it, another very popular game. You see a lot of fruit guts splattering all over the place when we do get 30 players in there. Uh, and it's a tremendous amount of fun, but we did have to have that one moment where we said, okay, that's it. We got to throw this away. Uh, number five, uh, don't get in the way of fun. And you know, you can see that I have a trend here, which is, uh, in general, I, I don't like to put big barriers between the player and the mechanic that they have joy. So if you watch your playtest and you're watching people having fun and smiling about something, then you want to just embrace that as much as possible. Don't put big blockades in front of it. I mean, we've been talking about it recently with Mario Maker, and you're saying, okay, you have to come in every single day for seven days to get all of the elements to do it. And it's like, well, a lot of us don't need to do that. You're, you're making all of these unfair requirements for us to get there. Um, so we, had, we actually had taken our game uh, SNB, and we said, well, let's make uh, another version of SNB because it's a low-hanging fruit uh, that, that you're kind of shooting at targets. And so someone had suggested, well, what if it was basketballs instead? And so we did a basketball game. And we had all these aspirations for making all of these uh, power-ups and things like that, and it turned out that no one really liked uh, the power-ups. All they liked to do was shoot the balls into baskets. And uh, that's why we have Robot Basketball has no power-ups. Um, you can pass back and forth, and that will make a power-up. But that's it. It's totally simple. And we just did not put anything in the way of people uh, enjoying themselves. And number six, and this is the last time I'm going to talk about fun, uh, is that fun things are fun. And this is just a general thing. I'm a person who plays out in the field a lot. I make card games and board games, and I make video games. Uh, and it turns out that a lot of the things that are fun on the field happen to be fun in, on the screen, like shooting a basketball into a basket or having some sort of competition that is like basketball. Uh, that's a lot of fun. People enjoy that. Um, we have a, a game called uh, B Racing. It's one of our favorite games. It's a competition between two teams, and it drew a lot of inspiration from games like uh, S Slash Dash and Killer Queen uh, and Capture the Flag and Tag. Um, and we, we drew a lot of inspiration from those things and put all those elements uh, into this game. And it turns out, like, even without too much playtesting, we, we immediately knew it was a ton of fun. So, 
Uh, that's good. Uh, rule number seven, know when you're done and uh, you're never really done. We kind of all know that from having to update every time. Uh, well, we finished robot basketball and, uh, and we would watch people play it a lot and a lot and a lot. And we decided that there were some things that we had to do to make it better. And so we made a tournament edition of the game and we tweaked the rules just a little bit and now we've made a much better game. Uh, but we still have our original Robot Basketball. Now we have Robot Basketball Tournament Edition, which is a, a different flavor of that same game. And it was because we didn't ever kind of say, well, we said one was done, it was done enough to put it out into the world, but now this other flavor is, is, uh, is an improvement. And we were able to see that. Um, Listen to your collaborators. So we have a very small team. Um, our team ranged, our development team uh, over the course of these 12 months has ranged from two, uh, who you see standing in front of you, and I guess Wim too, so three, uh, to eight. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, we have Jess up there. Jess was part of our team, one of our other designers for a long time. And Jess, Jess is really empathetic toward players, and she really wants the players to have a good time. I mean, we, we want the players to have a good time too, but we really like sophisticated video games. Um, Kevin will tell you about how wonderful War of the Roses is for like the next three hours. If you want to talk to him about it, it's not made in Unity, just so you know. Um, but, uh, but Jess was really uh, sympathetic toward the players and she would really feel empathy toward them. So she was the voice of reason uh, whenever we came to making decisions within the game and within our team. And one of the things that made the team dynamic so good is that we'd always move forward with consensus. So even when I came in with a silly idea and said, we have to do this, we didn't really move forward until all of us nodded our head and understood why we're moving forward. Um, and so you have to listen to your collaborators. Uh, another thing is we have a graphic designer, Jet, who is amazing. Um, if you're in New York and you need a graphic designer, Jet does it. Um, and we had a rhythm game called Sticky Floats Parade. And uh, we had to figure out how to like do a rhythm game with 30 players on screen all at once. And so she came up with all these different ways of, uh, of showing that because that's of course, you know, the guitar hero or whatever, you have to have a great UI system to be able to communicate that to the players. And so she came up uh, with, with how we portray it in Sticky Floats Parade. And, Everyone's missing it in that because I think I did it with 10 controllers. I can't play it all at the same time. Um, but, but it works out very well. It, that little notch, um, if you ever play the game, you'll understand exactly what I mean. Uh, second to last. When in doubt, simplify. Ah, oh, this is like the most, the second most important thing that, that we really learned, uh, which is that, you know, we, like I said, we always have these high aspirations for doing something crazy and complicated. And our boss came to us and had this vision for a game called Truckin' Amazing. And, uh, and, we had a developer who was working with us and she made it so complicated and we just kept play testing and play testing and play testing and no one got it except for her. She was awesome at it and everyone else was terrible at it and she just could not see like that, that it was not enjoyable by any of us uh, and she couldn't see that because she was so good at it. And so we stripped away everything from it and then we watched people play and then we stripped away more until we got to the very basic elements of the game and, uh, and now it's a, a pretty fun game. Still kind of difficult, surprisingly. Um, but it, we, it took all of that uh, pulling stuff out of it in order to make it a playable game and something that we actually felt like was we were comfortable releasing. Um, we actually had the same, uh, the same experience, uh, slightly different, uh, with a game called Feudal Football. Originally, uh, Kevin had proposed this idea of doing a, an a RTS uh, for our system. And we were really excited about doing an RTS for our system, but then we were watching uh, we were trying to figure out how you'd explain that to people who just came in off the street. And, uh, and we decided we needed to have something that's like an RTS, but, uh, but kind of pulled back and was a little bit more simple than that. And so we have a game called Feudal Football, which has elements of RTS, which f football does, if you think about it as well. Uh, and it's a ton of fun. Okay, the last one is uh, communication is key. Uh, we have a very small team, and even so, we captured everything that we could get. Uh, we captured all of our notes um, in Trello and all of our feedback and stuff like that, so that way Kevin would know what to do. He would know how to move forward and um, how to proceed, and, and none of that good thinking would be lost. And otherwise it would be, because it's you know, I, I go up to his desk a lot because we sit next to each other and I say, hey, can you fix this and this and this? And he hears maybe one of those because by the time he's fixed it, you know, the other two things are lost. Um, so that's it from the design perspective. I do have a million other things that I could say, but I want to turn it over to Kevin. He's going to talk about developing uh, all of these games. And uh, thank you. Yeah. There you go. Hey, guys, what's up? Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of my points because we're running out of time and I 
wonder if we have some time for, I think it would be great to have some questions and answers. Um, so, yeah, be organized. I'm going to skip over that. Plan ahead. I mean, these are great slides, but I'm going to skip, skip over that because we're running out of time. <laughs> but um, this is a good one. Uh, never underestimate the value of a full-scale test. So when I'm sitting at my desk and I have my two controllers and I'm planning everything out and everything is great, I make so many assumptions about how it's going to work with the people in the space that you know, you kind of get lost that it's, you're completely surprised by how different it is once you have actually bodies there. Once you have five people there, it's a completely different experience. And once you have 30 people there, everything breaks. You know, everything is broken. The first time we had one of our games uh, 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 exposed to 30 people, nothing worked. And then you have 30 people standing in your space with nothing to do, which is great. Um, Developers develop differently. I'm going to skip over that as well. Um, creating extra code. Uh, if you're not new to development, you already know, th know this. But I spend a lot of my time just creating code just for testing purposes, just for spawning in players, being able to test for all of the, um, for all of the possible problems that could come up with a large audience, because I can't, I can't always get 30 people into the space. It's not, that, it's not that easy, even with free pizza. Okay. Um, so this is, this is one of those examples of creating extra code is, I, what, does this, what does this level look like with 30 players? Because when you're creating this track and you just have you and your other controller in there, then it feels very nice and spacious and open. But once you spawn a whole bunch of players in there, it's, you see it very quickly gets cramped, crowded. Um, Creating tools to uh, avoid repetition. This is, this, is, uh, this is more if you are creating a lot of games in a very short time, which we knew we were doing. Um, all of these games are going to have some very similar features. They're all going to uh, trigger the lighting events. They're all going to have sound. They're all going to keep score. There's no reason for you to write that all out separately. So uh, really, if you plan ahead, you can um, develop some little tools to that you can just plug into from your other games. Um, yeah, lighting effects. OK, don't reinvent the wheel. We are not using the Unity networking, but we also didn't bother to write our own stuff. We didn't uh, make our own protocols. Uh, we just used like UDP and TCP and uh, all over OSC to make it nice and uh, easy to use, and there's no reason to not use the tools that are out there. Um, right, so if you, are, if you have a controller and you're th sending out um, a gyroscope data every frame, which is probably not a good idea, and uh, button clicks, and you're sending back sound requests from the game itself, that's not a lot of load when you have one controller. But when you have 30 controllers, it quickly adds up. So um, in our case, we kind of got rid of encryption to speed everything up. But I'm comfortable with telling you this, because if I ever showed you the SSID, you wouldn't be able to type it. That's how long it is. Uh, <laughs> so we're on a private network, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, the Unity community, without you guys or without the gentlemen who answer all my awesome questions, uh, none of this would be possible, right? You guys are awesome. Study your collaborator's code. And I, I say this more because I am self-taught. I went to school for graphic design, for digital media, so Photoshop and 3 Studio Max and stuff like that. and. Um, when I get to work with other people, I am exposed to some new code. What a, so a dictionary is awesome once you learn it, you know? So if you see something that you are exposed to that you're not familiar with and you study it, it just, it's like learning a new spell, you know? It en enables you. It's really awesome. Um, so I'm going to give Wim a minute to close up. And then if you have any questions or if you saw any points that you want to talk about, uh, We'll try to have some time for questions and answers. Thanks.
Thanks, Kevin and Pete. Uh, just uh, four, three or four thing, things in closing. Uh, some of the tools that, that we've put together and made available for um, external develop, uh, developers. Kevin, this is a cool pre -viz tool that um, uh, gives, gives you a, a view of what uh, our space is all about, what the lighting looks like in the space, uh, the, what the lighting cues are all about. The, there's actually a floor with the num numbers on it. The, they don't really mean anything other than um, for a player to stand on and when the hero moment happens in a game uh, and they've scored the, a high score for a particular round, the light uh, shines on that player as we go between rounds or if it's the win winner of the game, the light uh, shines on the, on the winner. That's, that has become, uh, again, we, we call it the hero moment, but it's what after um, players have played a couple times, they, they want and really seek uh, to get that light shining on them at the end of a... Uh, uh, end of a game. So this previs tool we uh, will make available. We also have an SDK. We've been invited by Unity to put it up on the asset store. I think we're going to do that. It's free SDK. Um, I have a, just a little license agreement that goes along with it, but um, we, we can also make that available. Um, and as I opened, uh, and I'm completely sincere and authentic about this, Anybody uh, in New York, you're welcome to come by. We just need a little advance notice uh, when you're coming. Love to have you come in uh, to our space. We need, uh, if you want to bring people along, that's great because the experience really uh, shines and is uh, distinguished when more players are in the space uh, and, and not less. So uh, we, would, we would encourage you uh, to do that if, uh, if, if you're in the area and, and would like to see it in, uh, in, in uh, uh, a first person view. Um, contact information is here. I have uh, business cards uh, for anybody who uh, we can, I, I don't want to encroach on our, on the next presentation, uh, but I think we can take a couple questions if anybody has any. Uh, otherwise, if not, we'll, uh, we'll adjourn and uh, let, the, uh, let the next session uh, go underway. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. I get, we have, a, he's our, he's the next speaker, so. He, he's given us a little time. That was nice of him to, to do. Any, any questions? Hey, guys. What's up? Hi. <laughs> um, so I have two questions, actually. My first one is um, my professor actually always talks about, like, game design. You have to fail really quickly, and you have made 12 games in, like, 12, 12 months. How do you guys, like, how quickly do, like, you know, <laughs> fail? Before how qu how quickly do we fail? Is like, the question. Like not, it's not uh, like not like very fail, quickly, very often. <laughs> like like literally like day one is like okay well, we got this and it's like oh it's probably not gonna work. I'm just I'm yeah. Like, one thing you don't see in the twelve uh, twelve games in twelve months is the fifteen prototypes that uh, that we went through that are not part of our cycle. So we fail all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's very important to just knock things out and just identify what works and what right. doesn't work. We have, we have like, so we, we have maybe 200 I, game ideas all uh, written out, and then we have probably 50 complete game design documents. And then uh, from those, as a team, we would say, well, what, do we, what can we envision? And then Kevin would put something together, and then we... Um, there, you saw one of the circuit sur surfers went really far, had graphic design and everything, and then we just looked at it and was like, this is not going to work. But we had so many, like, wobble. Uh, we just yeah. On the first day, I had a, a stack of game ideas that, yeah. that the designers gave me, and I was just like, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> yeah, and also there was some practicality in it. Mm. If he said, uh, it's possible, because he always says everything's possible, it's possible if we had six months, then i say, okay, well. We don't have six months. <laughs> okay, cool. And uh, my other question is actually at Kevin. How do you debug your code so quickly? <laughs> uh, yeah, we have tools in there. So every time something crashes, I get an email. Oh. <laughs> and uh, if, I, if I have it in debug build, then it tells me the line to go to. And it's all just Unity stuff. I mean, they, it, it's really good, great tools to debug. It's, very straightforward. I'm not doing anything special. Right, because it's like we're eating pizza and then you're just like done. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I try. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our other presenters. Back. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you thank all you. very much yes. for uh, sitting through our presentation, especially on the end of the good like, night.
Okay, great, great. 